failure with Comcast is all the copper the, the because the it's 30 years the old internal wiring of the building is is atrocious Off to get his eggs.
Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global, our first hour is general discussion about digital and media production. Uh, and our second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. Today, we're going to talk about some of our projects in the past. We'll show you a couple of photos and uh, talk through those and, um, and and answer your questions about them. So, um, so go ahead and get ready for that. Um, and go ahead and throw those questions in for the first hour. Uh, we've got a great panel here, very technical panel. So you can uh, definitely ask a lot of questions. Jonas is here again for the Friday, so uh, so cloud is on the table. Uh, so definitely, um, you know, ask ask those questions there. In fact, I have a question for you, Jonas. Um, uh, so I'm thinking of turning one of the melees into a playout bean. Um, it's just a basic install. There's nothing. Uh, yeah, just and download it, install it. That's it. And then and then it's just a matter of getting its IP and delivering that to the ATEM. Yeah. So. Uh, with the latest version, you can now also tell it to like open and full screen on boot and autoplay and all that because it's been that's, used in digital signature a bunch. That's great. Um, and it's got two HDMI outs. Can you run two instances? Probably not because it's not a single IP. Right now. Mm. That'd be really cool. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> so, so anyway, so I will tell you, Courtney, I, I, uh, this one's it's it, the one the first one I got was cool for a while. Uh, you know, I didn't really push it that hard. Yesterday I was setting up a second one, and I could have cooked an egg on it. It was really it well. Really that's hot. because the outside of the case is the heat sink, right? <laughs> so anyway, Tip. so that, yeah. <laughs> so so um, anyway, that that's cool. Uh, one one I, uh, one other thing before we get started that I thought was kind of fun is I got a, the smallest keyboard ever. This is a. Uh, Someone was posting this on Twitter, and I, it's like a, I, so when I do presentations, I normally d use um, a. Is that control, alt, and delete? I was just about to say, is <laughs> yeah, that, is that control, control, alt, delete? delete? <laughs> <laughs> well, I usually use this little stream deck, uh, for, but I realize I'm only using three keys, you know, forward, back, and then I something else if I need it. And um, and so I, I saw someone on Twitter post this up. I haven't plugged it in yet, but I'll give you feedback. But I was like, this will be a great little one just for forward back. And I just thought it, it was so, it's it's like, I don't know, like $20. Like it, it's much less expensive. So I can put this, this stream deck to use somewhere. Is it's, it a wired keyboard? <laughs> It is. It is. I don't have it plugged in. It's a USB C. So it's uh, it is it is a wired it's a wired, little wired keyboard. So you know, it was on sale. It was on sale on, on Amazon. So you know, it was less. I don't know how much less, but it was less. All right, let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Go, ahead, Jason. Chris Widener from Lafayette, Indiana, writes in with an Obspot URL and says, "Now with NDI and HDMI out, what do we think? I'm looking forward to getting my hands on one." You know, I think it just depends on what you're what you're planning to do with it. So, I, you know, I think that the um, the the I'm I have to admit that because I really uh, because I really want to have a short depth of field, and I, I'm usually want bigger cameras. Um, I have a little I have a harder time um, you know jumping into the into the tail uh, with, or or any of these. Um, now, I do use the um, and I'm trying to find it. I think that the uh, the link didn't take me directly to it. So I'm, uh, oh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Jonas. So I might be the only one who finds this weird, but they announced it and now they're raising money through a Kickstarter again. That is kind of like not speaking to the best of like interest that was generated in that product. Um, also, it does too many things like, if they now also add that it automatically switches between two of them via a smartphone app, I think then you have like everything, every feature in there. And the question is if it does any of those features good. Um, I do like that they specifically mentioned that you can run it over ethernet. Um, we'll just need to test it and we'll see. Um, they don't mention what NDIHX version it is. So it might be, oh, the, that they mentioned it's NDI HX3, so it can be H265. Can be useful, but then keep in mind that if you ha already have an existing NDI workflow, it might not be compatible. Make sure that uh, your software switcher also works with NDI HX3, because otherwise, it might not work with that specific uh, op spot. Good, Courtney. Yeah, I was just looking at it. It's 
it's a Kickstarter, so it's not available yet. They're trying to, I guess, raise enough money to put it into production. It looks like it's going to be priced from, it says uh, 40% off starting from $419. So it's going to be a bit pricey, but if it can pull off the uh, NDI and wireless uh, connection, uh, that should be pretty good. It says uh, wired or wireless uh, and NDI. So we'll see if they raise their uh, <clears throat> raise enough capital on uh, Kickstarter to put it into production. But right now it's paperware. Yeah, I mean, and I think that a lot of times people use Kickstarter as a PR stunt as less than, I mean, they're obviously going to produce it. So they're using, they're using it just as another network, another output to get people interested in it. And if it's 40% off that, that of the four, you said four out of $420 or 419. So that's um, what, that's 260. <laughs> that's yeah, two, sorry, excuse me. Yeah, that's 260. Um, uh, so that's less than the the link. So I mean, getting it there. I think the problem is is that at four nineteen. Well, that's now, also it starts at four nineteen. But what does that mean? With forty, what, what with would you add? Forty percent off. I guess maybe you want to license the NDI. Maybe that's available as a separate license or a separate uh, upgrade. You know. Oh right, yeah. The license of the NDI could could be part of the problem. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So it, you know, it's interesting. It is. I think that what got me excited about the link so quickly was the software, and so and and no one's been jumping up and down about the Opspot software. So, excuse me, I'm I'm gonna hand it off for the next question. The cost is nothing to sneeze at. Andy Kokendorfer writes in from Vieira, Florida. Thoughts on Sarui lenses? Uh, they are offering a budget Super 35 set of cinema lenses, and he includes the link from No Film School. Thoughts? Haven't used them. Uh, yeah, go, Courtney. Yeah, this is the first time I've seen them. I, have, I didn't get a, I didn't get a chance to go to the website yet and take a look at them. Uh, there are some uh, lower priced Super 35 uh, cinema lenses out there. I haven't looked at these particular ones, um, so I can't really comment on them. Go ahead, Sky. I was just made aware that Sigma has made some cinema fixed lenses specifically for video, and I did get to test those out. Um, lovely bokeh. So I don't know about these. Again, the price point and how often do you need cinema lenses? That's a, a thing that you might be able to rent, but maybe these are something you could, you know, afford. Consequently, you get some practice on them. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times the glass is pretty good. You have the gears, you have the pieces there. So, it, I mean, it's it's um, a one point two is a really That's nice sweet. lens. Yeah. What? I, what? How would you use a? If I can catch you between sneezes, sorry. Yeah, you're allergic you to, to talk uh, about. Uh, <laughs> Sony, keep going. The difference between um, a cinema lens and a just a standard lens. Why would why would you want to use a cinema lens? Um, well, I mean, one of the big can, advantages is the gears, you know, so yeah, you have right. the, you know, so you manual, have those manual control, you mean all the manual control. And so typically you can now put follow focus on it, you know, so, so you have, um, so you'll, you'll typically put those on rails and then you'll have it. And then typically, <laughs> excuse me, sorry. Typically you will have, uh, um, back focus. So now you have, you know, so you're able to actually zoom through. Oh, well, this you don't have to worry about it because it's a prime. So, but but that would typically be the other thing. Good, Courtney. Yeah, and I might point out that the uh, pricing, as you see here on their web website, the cost of each uh, prime lens is uh, three hundred and forty nine dollars, which is about the price of a lens cap from a you know a Zeiss or a Panavision camera lens. So. Uh, you know, it has that going for it. I wonder what the quality of the glass is at that kind of, at that kind of price. You know, I, you know, I kind of wonder. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah. I mean, the other main difference between a cinema lens and a normal one is that um, it's declicked. So you can roll through the aperture kind of seamlessly also, you know, with the gears. Um, 1.2 is great assuming it can actually rack and hold focus, which, you know, at that depth of field is kind of a big if the, the really hard part even for a for a prime lens is um if, if you have a large depth of field or i'm sorry a narrow depth of field um it better be accurate 
um, throughout the entirety of the lens. And, and if not, it's going to, it's going to be a lot of work to keep it sharp. All right. I'm going to take over here for a little bit. Uh, Courtney. Yeah. I, and I was reading the review, a review of it here online. I had a chance to, to browse through the website here. Um, and they said the 35 and 55 millimeter seem to match, but the 24 millimeter lens has pretty severe color shift. And that's when you're using primes, uh, color matching between the lenses can vary. And it is a big problem if you're shooting a, a feature film or something or, or any kind of film and you're switching between primes. If there's a dramatic uh, shift in the color response from one lens to the next, it's going to be a nightmare in color correction and post as you cut back and forth between those different lenses. Yeah, I think this is one of those uh, oxymorons like dream kitchen and military intelligence. I don't think budget and cinema belong in the same sentence. Uh, let's go to the next question. James Brooks in New York writes in, where is a good place to start to learn about Dante Audio? Thanks. Mr. Preto, what do you know about Dante Audio? Go to the Audinate site and take all of the three different exams. It takes about a week. I passed all three of them. The nice thing about passing all three of them is you don't have to ever take them again because your grandfather did. If you take number one and number two, when they change the test, you have to retake those again. But as a level three guy, you don't have to retake the tests. So if you take all three, do they guarantee that you'll never forget any of it also? <laughs> I forgot it all already the <laughs> next week after I passed. And you said you said it took you about a week to get through it, it took all. Took me a week to pass all three. Yeah, you did it like a year and a half or two ago, right? Yeah. All right, let's quiz John. Uh, next question. Samuel Nordvik writes in from Norway. What tool do you use to grab a quick thumbnail from YouTube um, for or no, sorry, for YouTube from a YouTube live stream? Jonas. I am super bad with that. I just full screen it and then I use a screen capturing tool like a green shot. And like green shot is a great tool because you just hit a print on your keyboard and it freezes everything. And then you can draw where you want your thumbnail. So you can like even do a little push in or you can say escape. And then because that's not the frame you want, and then you hit print again. And that way you really have control what the actual images you are getting. Um, that's how I do it. Jonas, I'm furiously looking. I don't see a, a button that says print on my keyboard. Uh, Sky. Well, uh, difference between a Mac and a Windows machine. Command Shift 4, that gives you the ability to scroll across with your mouse uh, and shape the, the square that you want and it gets you a portion of the screen. Command Shift 5, again, on a Macintosh system. You get the entire uh, screen and then you can crop it later. It doesn't anymore. John, you're saying that shift that changed? Five is There's, video. Three, three is entire screen. Three. There you go. Yeah. So there are three different options there. I also use the Downey Four app. Brilliant for uh, bringing YouTube videos in, into your system. I think you get options of how you want to save it, whether it's an MP4 or other options. Yeah, there's about, I mean, honestly, there's about a dozen variants of the Mac screen capture. There's the, you know, one of them, if you hold down another button, it actually puts it into your copy buffer. So you can go and paste it right into another app. Uh, one of them, you know, makes a, a, a thing. If you hit the space bar, it'll grab the whole window with the Mac shadow. R really cool stuff. Um, also, it's important to remember that you can also use, I believe it's the period and the pause in YouTube to step forward frame frame advance if you're trying to get just that sweet frame. Alex? Yeah, um, generally if I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna use Downey, I'm gonna download it, and then I'm gonna open it in something that I can export a frame out. And it just means that I, I'm just particular about not wanting to have any weird edges or be at 1888 by you know some, something where I'm just a little short. Um, so or so I, uh, um, I just do it that way. It's so fast that it doesn't, you know, Downey will download a whole video that like our entire show in um, less than a minute. So, you know, if I'm building a, a template, it's just easier for me to just grab it and then bring it into an editor or whatever and just export it out. Next question. Douglas Carmichael writes in, do you think we'll see software-based switchers like Mimo Live and vMix supporting HDR? Jonas. It depends how they're um, built. If they use their own image pipeline, 
um, it will be easier for them to add HDR, but then also what flavor of HDR are you talking about? Like, do you need metadata with it? Do you just need a different a gamma curve? Do you need 10 bit, which like technically you can do HDR and 8 bit, but that's not that much uh, dynamic range you can put in there. So the first step is to get them to 10 bit. Um, OBS technically, uh, vMix, for example, technically could get there sooner. You already see OBS having uh, probably right now the best HDR support of like the sub a thousand uh, US dollars software switchers, um, sub 2000 probably, um, especially since uh, YouTube worked with them on like mapping and um, especially for the gaming space where you actually have a lot of HDR content from um, the different games, it really works well with OBS because you can tone map it, you can produce the HDR stream, you can uh, take your HDR game and put it into SDR. Um, but then for something like Mimo Live, it a lot depends on the underlying framework. So as soon as uh, Apple and Mac OS and their you know, AV foundation adds more features for HDR and makes that even more accessible, I think you'll see a lot more software adopt adoption for something like vMix. It might be a little harder. Um, depending on what underlying framework they use. And then like you have a lot of things that are based on GStreamer or FFmpeg. They're in theory, you could already build like 10 bit uh, HDR timelines, but then like with the metadata, it's always a little complicated as soon as you need the metadata. I just want to remind everybody, I think it, I believe it was yesterday, we had a whole second hour about HDR stuff. Uh, Alex? Yeah, I think OBS is already, as Jonas said, is already supporting it. I don't know how how well it supports it, as as Jonas said, but it, it does. So the software can definitely do it. It's just a matter of of how quickly. I don't think it's going to be a priority, probably for Mimo Live or VMix. I, I, it's probably it's a lot of work. So it turns out the ten bit is a heavy lift, you know, for a lot of folks. And so, um, so getting to ten bit is is going to probably delay it from going into most things um, in the short term. It's just like a wafer thin more than 8-bit, isn't it? You would think so. <laughs> Next question. Todd Rains in Allen, Texas writes in, the Lumix BGH1 has so many .mov recording formats. What's your decision process for choosing the record format? Jonas. So you want to think about two things. Uh, first, what is the content you're trying to record and what is the product you're trying to produce? Um, talking head, you probably don't even need a format that is capable of 120 FPS or variable frame rate. Um, what is your editing pipeline? Do you, what is your um, product that you need to deliver to your client? Is it something that is going to be color graded? Do you need to produce it in VLOG? Do you need to have 422 color? Do you have to need 10-bit color? Is HEBC encoding fine? Uh, is a longer GOP fine? So like that's all the different formats that it gives you. And then like there's a difference in there if you uh, record it with AVC or which uh, with HEVC, which is like H265, which has a better compression. So you get more visual data for the same amount of uh, bit rate. But yeah, if you scroll through the handbook, there's like so many things. But then um, it depends. Like, do you want an all I all intra frame uh, codec, which will give you, will um, use more bandwidth. So you want to make sure that you actually have the bandwidth on all intra uh, format. And then you can use that to get a better picture. You get better. Each frame will be better, but the total might be worse. So it really depends on what uh, the thing is you're shooting. Um, VFR is not enabled on all of those. Um, HLG and like, the HDR formats aren't also enabled on all of them. So it also depends what does the container support. So there's like MP4, MOV, and then what codec is being put in is what they surface where you see multiple MOV options. And then you can choose quality from like all intra, long gob, all of that. Courtney? Yeah, yeah, Jonas covered it pretty well there. Uh, I would say that you'd make your decision as you can see, here's a, here's a list of all the recording formats starting with ABC Intra and uh, with long gob H.264, 264 long gob, MOV or MP4, 10-bit, 422. Then it goes down through all these different ones. And also it, it can go external. And I think what, what you're going to make your decision on is based on your recording media, what you've got, what you can afford, 
because uh, the uh, higher bit rate, uh, higher quality uh, versions of the AVC Intra is going to take uh, recording media that can record fast enough to capture all this uh, in real time because it'll take uh, some of these up to 400 megabits per second require, are required up to about 400 megabits per second on some of the higher quality ones. So if your recording media is capable of it, you can use the higher frame rate, the uh, higher quality bit rates, and it'll be uh, you know less chance you need to recode to go into editorial as long as your editor editing software can handle the higher bit rate. Um, and you could also choose to record externally because there's an SDI output. You could use an external Atomos or some other type of external recorder. Uh, and you've got more choices there and selections of media. If you're using a NVMe SSD, you know, you can record the higher bit rates. If you're using a, a you know, standard high speed uh, uh, SD card, you might be limited into what formats you can use. So it's probably based, you'll probably make that decision on A, the quality, uh, the best quality that you can get uh, on the media that you own or can afford. I'm just going to interject here just a little bit. You know, talk with your editor because workflow and turnaround may affect the format that you use. It's not always we need the very, very best. Alex? Yeah, I think color correction is a big deal. If, if you think you're going to need to do any kind of color correction, you're definitely going to want 10 bit 422. Um, that'll be the, the top one there. Um, if, you're, if you think that you have, you're just trying to cut it, you can probably get away with 420. I would stay away from anything that says long gop. Um, long gop is going to be harder to, that's a group of frames. And so that means it's going to be, a long gop is going to have, um, um, there's not going to be keyframes at, you know, um, across, you know, the keyframes are spread out a long distance, which makes it much harder to edit and also reduce, it makes it much more efficient, but it's, uh, it can be very problematic. Um, I generally will lean towards the highest quality that I can do because drives have become pretty inexpensive, um, but you have to decide on on your storage capacity. Uh, but 10-bit will allow you 10-bit and 422. I don't see a lot of reasons to do 10-bit 420. So there's a 420 option there with 10-bit. I feel like, you, you, you know, you could, but you're kind of throwing away enough color that probably doesn't matter anymore. So, um, so anyway, it's kind of an odd solution there. Uh, definitely would not record an H.264 or 265 if you want to do anything with it later. So, um, and I almost always record uh, externally. So the, the camera record is simply a backup to what I'm doing. So oftentimes my cameras are set as high as they can go as far as the record goes. So if I have to fix something, I can go back because I'm recording in ProRes typically, uh, either ProRes 422 or ProRes 4 HQ um, on an external deck. Uh, and, and, so that's, and so usually that's what I'm gonna use in production. And the cameras are only there because something went horribly wrong. Sky? I once attended a photo uh, conference, and the best part was attending a side meeting with a photographer from ESPN, uh, sorry, from Sports Illustrated, and then there was an art photographer beside him, and they both answered this question, and one as the artist, he wanted the ability to have all of the colors, all of the color depth, all of the size, basically shooting a, what used to be a negative, so he could process art in, in time. The Sports Illustrated guy, he said, no, I have to shoot in burst because I don't know what I'm capturing. Plus, my fast turnaround to get it to the publisher is is news in in its uh, time constraints. So consequently, it's what is you going what are you going to be uh, needing it for helps you decide which of these. But test all of them, play with all of them and really get to know your tool. And then Jonas. One thing to keep in mind. Um, we we dipped on the recording uh, media earlier. Make sure that that recording media actually uh, supports sustained write at the um, m bits that you need, because it might have like a little buffer or something, and allows you to like start up with that recording, and then suddenly you're in a hassle, and in the middle of the great interview, you have to say, hey, "Sorry, can we stop?" Uh, somehow my SD card suddenly decided it doesn't want to record anymore. So make sure that you actually do a test record over the length that you would expect with the media that you have to be 100% certain that you actually can sustain that write speed because nothing is worse than stopping an interview mid-show. So, so with that, I just want to take this moment to thank all the 
the little people, and I don't mean diminutive, but I mean insignificant, that I was able to step on to get to this point in my career, to have the moment to host this show. Uh, but it is with great sadness yeah. and melancholy that I and humility, relinquish. Right. Yep. And humility <laughs> that I relinquish <laughs> my reins of this fine, august show of people and return the control back to Alex. Alex, thank you so much for this opportunity to serve the community. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> you were doing so well. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> um, uh, and a quick reminder, though, of course, that you can ask questions throughout the first hour. Uh, if you've got questions about show and tell, it's hard to have a lot of questions about show and tell until you see it. But anyway, uh, but if you have questions about the, uh, you know, about our production, get ready for that. But if you have first hour questions, there's still room for that. So go ahead and throw those questions in and make sure to vote on those questions um, so that we know what order you'd like us to ask them in. All right, let's go ahead and go jump to the next question. Eric Hers in Hartford, Connecticut writes in, what are the codec options for sending audio via NDI? If I'm Using NDI HX video with compressed H.264, it must have some sort of latency. How do I keep audio and video synchronized if I'm using OBS with NDI HX video and various audio sources? Go, Jonas. Funny that you would ask. So, NDI itself is Transport Plus a protocol. So, NDI uses Speed HQ, which is a proprietary codec that is apparently visually lossless. So when you look at an image of the source and what NDI produces, it is you don't see a difference, but there, of course, is a difference. It's not lossless because you don't have the bandwidth for that. Then NDI HX goes further and uses H.264 and H.265 as the codec. Um, technically, you could also use different codecs, so check with the manufacturer of the product, but H.264 and H.265 is what you will use most. So common choice with that would be AAC. So then you'll have an AAC audio stream. Technically, you could also send a different audio stream down. Um, if you only want audio over the NDI feed, then make sure that your tool also works with that. Some of them like want to see the video and then don't work because they don't get a video and only audio. And if you need to sync it, OBS is really great at having all these delays. But what to keep in mind is OBS is not a hardware switcher. So that means you need to be your own um, limit. You need to set yourself a limit where you can go and what you can do. Because OBS will let you like, oh, yeah, sure, let's delay this video source by seven days. It will just say, oh, yeah, sure, let's do it. It will never work. It will crash and burn and ruin your whole show. But OBS will allow you to do that. So if you go into OBS, you can delay the, uh, the video delay to the video sources. Keep in mind, now it's storing each frame. Like, let's say you want to delay it by 20 frames. Now it needs to somewhere store 20 frames. So there's a limit to how much you can do there. It's going to be initial pro additionally processing, taking that frame, storing it somewhere, and taking it back. With audio, that doesn't really matter. Audio is so small compared to video. Um, you're good to delay it a fair amount. Um, so I, what I would do is make sure you get whatever camera that is the most used camera that you're going to be the most latent and then add a delay to the rest. And sometimes if you only have like a crowd shot on one of them, it's fine if the crowd shot isn't the right delay as long as the close-up of people talking is the right latency. So that feels right and with crowd shot, isn't it? Good, Chris. Yeah. I'll tell you, Eric, I really lean into the fact that the human mind has the ability to kind of let go of latency issues pretty quickly. If you were to try to watch TV in my living room, for example, it's horrible. We get used to it. I, Next question. I, <laughs> Alton Christensen <laughs> in New York, New York writes in, uh, quick time record stats. I like the way Mimo Live presents record stats um, or recording stats on the ISO records, frame rate, drop frames, etc. Is there a way to monitor this when recording a source using the native QuickTime app? Jonas? I don't know. I don't think the QuickTime app can do that. I, I'm pretty, I'm, in fact, I'm nearly certain that the QuickTime app won't tell you that. Um, go ahead, Jonas. So if you want to do it after the fact, you can use uh, InfoB and have it generate you some stats of like quiet audio parts and freeze frames and black frames and all that. But you asked a question about a Mac OS tool and uh, yeah, I don't 
think uh, QuickTime has those stats and don't doesn't expose them, then you would need to like rebuild QuickTime on based on uh, AV Foundation. And yeah, I don't think that that exists. That's where you want to have a separate in- recorder that is built for that, has all the stats. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, on the back end, um, QuickTime is not actually, if you if you like really break this down, is not actually the encoder, even if it's recording. Um, in order to have accurate stuff like dropped frames, you, you would need that in order to display that. So no, there's no way to do that. Next question. Andy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida writes in, Shopify's CEO claims meetings hurt productivity and has installed a meeting cost calculator on each employee's desktop. Thoughts? And he includes uh, an article from Fortune magazine. Go ahead, Jonas. I think it's a fun idea that every time you book a meeting and like how many people are in a meeting that don't really need to be in the meeting or who should just get a summary of this is the actionable items from a meeting. Like think about how many and what they do is they have like the amount of people that are in there and what their typical salary is breaking broken down to an hour and then they add that together. So imagine how much money you can waste by inviting all like your C-level execs to update them on something that really should have been like five paragraphs in an email. Um, Also, there's like with remote work, there's like this next level of remoteness async work that is coming up. There's a... For example, Gumroad, the platform that I sell my stuff through, they only have freelancers that all work async. There's no meetings where you need to sync. It's all you work in GitHub. There's an issue. You solve it. If you can't solve it, you ping someone on GitHub. They chime in, help you. And that way you can, that's like the other extreme. But I think there's like also a happy medium that you can find by uh, making people aware of how much time and money they're wasting by sending an invite to all of those people. Yeah, go ahead, Sky. Uh, Water cooler used to be the place to hang out and and have longer conversations. And you would find information sometimes there, but a meeting was the responsible place of imparting information or discovering. And I think that's the challenge. If if your meeting is a creative, as in discovering of, of a situation, then sometimes those Maybe you need to spin off and have a secondary meeting with just a, a certain amount of people. But um, to be efficient, I really appreciated being in a 20-minute uh, constraint. And that's when we were working with with JJ specifically. He brought that into our, our creative process, and it forced us all to uh, not just uh, be more succinct, but be on target, on, on task. Go, ahead, Jason. See, I don't think he went far enough. I think he really should have taken any time a company computer is used for the reply all button and it should say, are you sure you want to do this? Because it's going to cost the company exactly this much. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, it points out that these meetings can cost between $700 to $1,600 for each 30-minute meeting. I think the old school of corporate uh, structure where you would have your individual departments, you'd have a a weekly meeting that all the department heads had had to attend where they would present printed reports for everybody to peruse uh, and report into the CEO or manager or middle level manager uh, what their progress has been is is a bit archaic, especially with a lot of people working remotely. And the development of uh, uh, shared documents on the internet is uh, can be taken to great advantage. So now that each individual department head can just put their progress onto a shared spreadsheet somewhere so that all departments have access to it all the time, so that you know the progress of each department in whatever you know uh, task they are doing. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to have a meeting just to update yourself weekly. And it does take a lot of time. You have to stop what you're doing. You have to prepare a report. You have to go to the meeting. And then you have to take notes at the meeting and take the results of those notes and apply them to your particular function. So um, I think it do, it is, uh, I think they're right in that uh, too many meetings can slow down productivity and interactive documents on the internet make things a lot faster and a lot neater and make for a lot better communication between departments without having to actually get together face to face. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that the, uh, the real challenges is that there are things that just get hashed out much easier when you're face to face than when you're, when you're typing, there's things people are willing to type. There's things that that get misunderstood. One thing I will say is that long meetings are really problematic. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, company that I did a lot of work with in 
a lot of it has to do with meeting rooms. You know, getting a hold of a meeting room is hard. And so all the meetings were 25 minutes long. Like they're just 25 minutes long. You very rarely saw a 55 minute long because they, they leave that five minutes to get out of the room so the next folks can get in. But 25 minutes of, of checking in is fine. Then the other thing is, is that I find that um, having the meetings happen throughout the day is really problematic for productivity. So a lot of times what I do is I have a tendency to push my meetings um, either way. So um, I try to have all my meetings in the morning and then a couple meetings in the afternoon, late afternoon, and have three, four hours chunked in the center that doesn't have any meetings. You know, and that that is a, I, I find that to be effective. I do think that the meetings are, I, I, I actually disagree somewhat in the sense that being able to get um, people on the same aligned. Sometimes you just need to be able to see them. I don't think you need to be in person, you know, Zoom to do that. But but I, I think that the walking to the meetings is not efficient. <laughs> but but I think that the the meetings themselves, oftentimes, if people show up on time, they're no longer than twenty five minutes. There's a hard agenda. We don't take extra time. We don't need it. Just give the money, give the time back. So a lot of times we we have a twenty five minute meeting that lasts ten minutes or fifteen minutes because there's an agenda and we know how to get through that. You know, we we know what we're trying to get to, um, and so um, I do think that they help a lot. Um, there's a a lot of things that get lost in in translation, um, but I do think that they have to be limited in in their scale. Next question. Paul Walhus in Austin, Texas writes in the Insta360 link has a drawback and can't show video on the app and in Zoom at the same time. Is there a way to fix this? Go ahead, Jonas. I mean, they could fix it, but I don't know if we even want them to fix it because what you need to keep in mind is now you're getting that video somewhere and need to place it in two places. Um, Mac OS is better at allowing you to use a camera multiple times. Uh, the browser is better at using a camera multiple times. But what they would need to do or could do to fix it involves too much image pipelines that I would want to use that camera after they did it. Because then they would basically need to send the image to the app and then export it into a virtual webcam driver again, allow the webcam to send the same image twice and none of that is really something that you would want. Um, I think it's probably, it's fine. We haven't had too much of an issue with it. Um, I don't have that problem. So I don't, I don't know what that, I, I, you know, maybe it's... Might be a Windows thing then. Yeah, yeah, because I, I, I'm able to see it in the Link app and and in whatever other app I'm in, I'm in on a Mac. So I haven't, I haven't seen that. It might be a Windows thing because I, I, don't, I don't have that problem. Um, next question. John Richardson in apparently both New York and Florida writes in, when we get footage from the field on SD cards, all the manufacturers create all kinds of garbage folders and files on the cards. On the editing side, is it important to keep these files? We always have just stripped out the footage. Is that okay? Uh, you want to keep the whole card. Go ahead, uh, Chris. Yeah, definitely. Um, just best practice is this. Take the entire contents of the card. It's, you know, camera A, card three. Make a folder on your computer called A3. Select all, copy, paste into the folder. If you want to use one of the, you know, file management tools like Shotput Pro or whatever, you're more than welcome to give them your money. Uh, it's just it's just going to copy this. It, it's going to do some data, some, uh, some, some uh, error checking. But... Copy the entire contents. It's not going to hurt you. It checks some. Thank you, Mickey. Um, it's not going to hurt you. It's going to take a tiny, tiny, tiny bit more space. Just take it all. Um, one of the things, and I'll give you a, a for a, for example. Um, on some of the cards, I believe, or cameras, I think it's like Sony. And and I'll tell you, uh, as an editor, I just I hate cameras. Uh, what? there will be like sidecar files and those sidecar files are what carry all of your LUT information or how the camera was set up. And so if you just take the MOV or the M4V or the whatever it container it's in, you don't get all that additional information. Just copy it all. Do yourself a favor, copy it all. It's not going to hurt. Good, Courtney. Yeah, I agree with Chris, the sidecar files that are put on there by the recorder, not necessarily, they don't come on the SD card. You will find sometimes hidden files or hidden folders or even an auto run exec program uh, on some of these uh, uh, SD cards because they offered uh, 
encryption. And uh, it would automatically put an encryptor or a decryptor uh, app onto your machine to allow you to encrypt or decrypt the, the information that goes onto the card. So if it comes with hidden files or folders uh, on the SD card, I would stay away from those kind of SD cards because you don't necessarily want it suddenly encrypting your, your data if you don't have the key or want to manage the encryption. Uh, but as far as the other folders that are created by your recording software, or your device that you're recording onto it, yes, take all of those files because the sidecar files are additional files that tell your editing software, et cetera, all the metadata that goes with each of those files. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Jason. Yeah, what everyone has said, but because you can't be sure and it depends on the camera and the camera manufacturer but actually sometimes even the camera sony's for example can be a little bit nebulous as to where you can actually go to get the file um, there are some kind of in-between codecs that where you can shoot stills and video at the same time and it's it kind of has to be unpacked in specific ways because it doesn't matter and those garbage files are usually tiny just grab them there's an app called hedge that does this pretty well too and chris I was going to say, first of all, could somebody please capture that moment where Courtney said, I agree with Chris and send me a link to that? That'd be awesome. <laughs> also, you know, Final Cut has a feature called Camera Archive, I believe. And literally, when you open up the import folder, you can select the card that, that you have uh, uh, attached to your computer. And then there's like, and again, I par pardon me, but I believe it's called Camera Archive. And it essentially just zips the entire thing onto your drive from which you can then extract all the camera uh, footage. but And it, and that's exactly doing, uh, it's doing exactly what I said. Just copy the whole thing. Next question. Douglas Carmichael writes in, has anyone had experience with Triplite or Eaton uh, UPSs? I'm trying to decide between the Eaton 9SX, which is retails in the US for $1,280, or the Triplite SU1500XL, which retails for $686. They are both online UPSs, but I'm only familiar with Eaton. Need something that filters power. Yeah, I think you're going to find that the Eaton is a little bit higher quality than the Triplite. So the Triplite is a good, it's a solid one, but the Eaton is is a, usually usually a step up from there. Um, so, I mean, we, we kind of go Eaton and then Liebert is, is the next one up from there. Next question. Henry Ramos in Yonkers, New York writes in, can we gang up on Sony and Panta to update their PTZ NDI versions? Prefer to purchase the option rather than add additional encoders. I don't know. You know, I, I, I think that some of the Sonys are coming out with NDI and, and I'm not sure if they're, if you're talking about updating their, ver I guess it's just that they're using an older NDI version. Um, but I know that like the, I think a lot of them are coming out with NDI. I believe that the 150, the Panasonic 150s have NDI and the Sonys have, I know the FR7 has an NDI option. Um, so I do think that they're there. Uh, yeah, as far as uh, upgrading them, I'm, you know, that, that oftentimes takes a little time on their end. Um, next question. Eric Kurz in Hartford, Connecticut writes in, I joined late and I'm now using YouTube as a live DVR to catch up while also on the Zoom. How do I turn down the Zoom audio while keeping my YouTube audio up so I can hear both but are focused on YouTube? Go ahead, Jonas. So if you're on Windows, Windows really has a really nice built-in audio mixer. If you right-click your little uh, sound icon and then go to audio mixer, you then can change each app's volume to your headphones individually. But then you can uh, bring up YouTube, bring down Zoom. And even better, if you happen to have an Elgato Stream Deck on Stream Deck Plus, they have a really great integration with that audio mixer that allows you to mute uh, separate uh, channels. It allows you to change per app. The great thing is their app even allows you to do it per app instance. So sometimes I have like I'm in like two, three, four, five Zoom calls, and I can have a fader for every single one of them. So I just keep them all low, and then if someone I hear my name, I just fade up and say, "Huh, what? Can you repeat that?" Um, so that's a really great solution for that. And on Windows, that's a really solid solution. That's how I do it. Go ahead, Courtney. And if you don't have Windows or, or you, you don't have access to the individual faders, the other thing you can do is go into Zoom and just select an audio interface for the speaker that you're not plugged into. If you have more than one audio interface or get a little USB audio interface and uh, route the output of Zoom 
to that USB interface and just don't monitor it. Or you could control it separately over the separate interface if you want to turn up and down a speaker, for example, uh, on that second interface. So just select an, a different interface for Zoom than you're using for uh, YouTube. Next question. Jack Cannon in Phoenix, Arizona writes in on Mac OS, which version of OBS are you using that's stable-ish? Also, anyone using OBS on Mac OS Sonoma, I'm having a more than usual unstable experience. Yeah, yeah go, um, go ahead, Jason. I reject the premise of the question. OBS is not stable in Mac OS, period. Yeah, you know, I think that you're going to have trouble with, yeah, OBS is not super stable on the Mac, and now you're using an, a, a beta Mac software that is probably ahead of where OBS is. So I think that on Sonoma, you're going to find to, it to be really unstable. And I would probably, if you could roll it back, I would roll it back. Uh, because you know, OBS is usually behind when it comes to Mac support. And so if you're jumping into a beta version, they're probably going to be behind until the end of the year. That's my guess. <laughs> Maybe at least until October, November. So um, I don't think that they're, um, I think that you probably, it's not their, their strongest suit as it is. Um, next question. Paul Walhus in Austin, Texas writes in, what's the cheapest waterproof cell phone made or cell phone with a waterproof case? Uh, I don't know what the cheapest one is. The um, uh, the iPhone is uh, I have discovered is um, water. It's waterproof up to I think six feet, which was less than my the depth of my pool when I fell in. <laughs> I was sitting there talking on the phone. Did you go all the way to the bottom. Like <laughs> a couple weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, I was cleaning my pool while talking to uh, talking to someone on the phone and uh, hit my my pool has these rocks around it and I uh, just didn't get it quite right and um dropped into the pool and the, the phone was fine and so were the earbuds <laughs> so so they they uh but uh yeah it's it's waterproof um to some degree at least i think it's up to 18 feet i think is the current iphone um yeah next question douglas carmichael writes in has anyone worked with digital ocean for cloud hosting how does it compare to aws go jonas Yes, so I've used DigitalOcean. It's really neat if you have a single application that needs a single service. Um, their DNS is pr pretty great, and their um, storage also can be really useful if you need a little more cheaper option than AWS. AWS, you get a lot of options. There's like a lot of services. There's a lot of knowledge you also need, but also there is like, a lot of things out there on it. Digital Ocean is similar. Um, Digital Ocean also just acquired uh, paper space. So you'll see them add more GPU capabilities to their portfolio. Where Digital Ocean really doesn't work is if you need multiple things and you want to orchestrate them, then Digital Ocean, my experience gets a little more complicated. And we found, um, but Digital Ocean is fine. It's like, um, they do have a different arrangement with, uh, I think they're part of the uh, the bandwidth uh, union, so they don't want to charge you massive egress fees. But that's one of the things I would always keep in mind when comparing cloud hosts. What is your use case? How much traffic are you expecting? And then uh, judge on that. Yeah, one thing that I um, I'm, I still have to research, I was in a meeting with uh, someone and they were talking about Tata and I guess Tata doesn't charge egress fees. So um, so that's a, something that I, I, I want to do some more research on. Uh, a quick reminder that, of course, you can ask questions throughout the first hour uh, and into the second hour. You can ask questions during the second hour as well. Um, but we still have a little room, so go ahead and throw those questions in and uh, you can vote on those questions. Make sure that uh, we know what order you'd like us to ask them in. Uh, next question. Let's see, Eric Hurst in Hartford, Connecticut writes in, I wish that I could seamlessly attend live meetings in a DVR plus 2X mode. I would like folks to drop pins on the moments <laughs> that, I, that I should skip to. Text only summaries are not good enough and are too late. The value of meetings goes way down soon after it ends. Go ahead, Jonas. I mean, Zoom is kind of like doing out of this but post probably could try to keep up by like getting zoom to do it live but uh i found the zoom summaries are pretty good of uh meetings you could use I, that 
I do find it interesting, the idea of starting late and then just running faster. <laughs> yeah, I think we all just need an EVS. Like imagine you pipe your Zoom meeting into an EVS. Yeah, everyone just needs to live in Pittsburgh a little bit longer because everyone yeah. talks like this the whole time. We all talk really, really fast. And so it, 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 just, it just makes the meeting go a lot faster. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. What you do is you order two dozen donuts and sprinkle methamphetamine all over the top of them and send them to the meeting. <laughs> Speed up your he just took it to a whole nother level. Uh, <laughs> um, next question. Douglas Carmichael writes in, how do you get low latency iPad audio to and from a Dante network? Would the RME Digiface Dante be best or would a USB AVIO be enough? Go ahead, Jason. As with any class compliant anything, the simplest solution is the best. Dante AVIO with USB-C will work beautifully, so leave it alone. Yeah, I think that's probably your best bet. Uh, next question. James Folson in Minneapolis, Minnesota writes in, how do you share an audio or video with somebody specific that you don't really want to have a connection with? Note, friendly, but keep it private. Um, unlisted YouTubes, uh, Vimeo, uh, those are the, I mean, Frame.io at a higher level. You can just send them a link and have them, uh, you know, be able to, to, to look at it there and give you feedback even. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, if you have Google Drive, uh, which is free, you can put uh, you can store MP4s on it and send people a private link to that MP4 on your Google Drive, and they can uh, download it or view it uh, directly from their browser. I go ahead, Jason. And of course, depending upon the size of your video, you can always use hide my email and mail drop, and um, that that should get it done. Next question. Robin Cutshaw in Atlanta, Georgia writes in, have you installed a generator, battery, solar power solution for your house and studio? If so, which manufacturers have you used? Chris, weren't you looking at some of these options? There's a lot of, uh, not, not enough to give any like suggestions, but I will tell you there are, there are, um, the, RV community is really deep into this. Any sort of RV, four-wheel drive, overlander, people that pride themselves in, you know, going off grid for a, a lot of time, uh, for periods of time. Um, Keenan Campbell uh, is super deep into this. And I'll tell you that the thing that is the most interesting are what are called LifePo batteries. And I, I think I'm saying that right. They're they're about like half the weight of what you would expect a battery to be. And some of them even have built-in battery management systems. So like literally, it, it looks kind of like an oversized car battery, but it's Bluetooth. And as we know, everything is better with Bluetooth. So once you add the Bluetooth, you can monitor how the battery is charging, discharging, how much life you have left in it. Um, so there are things like that. There's the, So I will say this. I really want to build uh, a, a self-contained, um, like a shed or something with its own solar, with its own battery, with its own, uh, you know, chargers and stuff like that. I don't know that I'd go for generator, but, you know, living in California, you kind of have to have some, some, it, either you're totally fine if the power goes off, I'd look at it as a, you know, a day off, uh, or you have to have an alternate, you know, power system. Next question. Let's see. Gordon Lake in Los Angeles, California writes in, uh, why are some monitors able to accept 5994 video, but not 2997? Go ahead, Jonas. So what you want to look out for on the monitor is something called minimal hertz that describes how often uh, the monitor needs the picture to be refreshed. A lot of monitors have that at 50 hertz. So that uh, would mean 29 is lower than 50. It won't accept it. That's the whole edit thing we talked about uh, last week. 59 is over 50, so it can accept it. That's one of the big differences that you'll see between a TV and a monitor. A monitor will probably not accept anything under 50. A TV is more often fine with accepting 25 to 30. Um, but that would be the reason. Check what your monitor's minimum health rate is. I go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, as Jonas said, um, some of the uh, computer monitors aren't really designed uh, to accept the TV standards, which was uh, interlaced. Uh, you know, so they're looking for a fifty-nine nine four uh, 
per field. In other words, 2997 per frame. So um, uh, if they're progressive only, if they're designed, if the scaler that's built into the monitor is not designed to interpret in, uh, interlace, uh, a lot of times they won't accept 2997 progressive. Uh, so that may be the problem there. Next question. Uh, let's see, wait a minute, oh, had to refresh. There we go. Uh, Eric Hertz writes in, Cloudflare Stream also does not charge egress. They support RTMP in and out, SRT in and out, and WebRTC, WIP, slash WHEP in all, all on a global Anycast network. This lets you have one host name domain for a global input and output, which is a challenge with RTMP. Go, Jonas. I think we're almost just missing that. This show is brought to you by Cloudflare. Um, what he's talking about is you can also check the bandwidth alliance from Cloudflare, and there's a lot of uh, other services are in there. Valter is in there, Dreamhost, uh, Tencent, Scaleway, Oracle, and those are all uh, different cloud providers that have agreed to not charge or charge lower egress fees if you're going to another bandwidth alliance member. So what you can do is uh, Cloudflare is part of the Bandwidth Alliance. If you put them in front of your content, then you will be charged, not be charged with egress fees because it's first hitting uh, Cloudflare's network. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, if you are really scared about egress fees, you can always get a uh, stock pricing and uh, flow pricing instead of stock pricing. So you can say, I want 10 Mbits uh, instead of, I want to have a terabyte of transfer speed that that's then something you need to manage on yourself. What do you do with an influx of users? So that's kind of why we even see this bandwidth pricing. And then Cloudflare Stream really is a great solution. Um, one thing to keep in mind is WIP and WAP uh, is still in a beta state for Cloudflare right now. You need to sign up to a, a special beta program, but it is really cool. The latency is comparable to Zoom with uh, OBS is about to get a WIP uh, input or a whip output, and I tested it with that for our remote multi views, and it's really great because uh, the latency from Zoom versus OBS to Cloudflare and then uh, into a web browser over web is really almost the same. We see like 50 milliseconds difference, give or take, depending on where in the world you are and how servers are placed. But the great thing is if you use Cloudflare Stream, it's much more scalable. Um, and since you also mentioned the Anycast, uh, you will also be regionally routed to the closest uh, pop of them where you then can get the feed off. So it really is a great solution. Next question. Gordon Lake in Los Angeles, California writes in, what's the best way to achieve a gallery view? Blackmagic Multiview 16, a decimator, or another solution? Go ahead, Jason. Uh, I guess I, it depends on what you mean by a gallery view. If you're talking about a multiplexer, which in general is what those are, um, the way that I've done it most recently is um, is with a, a 32 inch 4K screen. Uh, LG makes these, and I, mean, I can't find the the model number at the moment. But I really like this because it will actually take 4K video in, scale it down, and kind of give me any combination that I need, um, kind of without any fuss. And I really like that. Go ahead, Jonas. So since you said best in there. Um, I would say uh, <laughs> you want to head over to a different website uh, from Veros. You're going to get a Carbonite or something similarly, and then you stack the MEs and use uh, the mini MEs and the ultra scenes to build a multi-view like the one that we have. It will set you back like between 20 to like 200,000 uh, grand, but uh, then you really will have the best gallery, 4K, HDR, everything. Next question. <laughs> Douglas Carmichael writes in, Cal Henderson, a co-founder of Slack, says that younger workers in some industries lose out on learning and mentorship when working remotely. Agree or disagree? Go ahead, Jonas. I mean, that statement can always be true if it's like generic enough. Some people lose out on some opportunities, but I think it's harder to get that um, connection. All of the remote companies that I've seen that thrive really well have like one-to-one -one relationships where you have like, as a new person, you get like your buddy or some buddy where you can uh, have a one-on-one -on -one relationship. They like show you around, they show you what's happening. Um, you have like a mentorship that way assigned. 
And then they do like either quarterly meetings in the region that you're in. So like Europe, America or something. And then they have a world meeting where you actually meet in person and just get along, have some fun. Um, and I have seen that work really well. But it's also a culture you need to foster where you want to have mentorship and where you want to have like share your knowledge. And like in programming, what we do often is pair programming, where you have a senior level developer not use his hands and guide someone through writing the code. And it's really great because it, it's so frustrating as a senior developer because the junior is still a little slower, but the junior now sees you explain the concepts while he writes it. And it's a really great way of learning and working together. And then that also works remotely. We have done that remotely a lot. And there are ways, but you need to want it and you need to be open for it. Go ahead, Sky. I, my wife is a teacher. We're we're discussing the the concepts of what the younger generation of the third, first, second, third graders are going to be like in ten years from now, because they're going to be running things. And since we've all been in this isolation pod for, you know, what is it? Uh, a habit takes twenty one days. We've had many twenty one days now to to learn new habits of being in isolation. So uh, to his question, uh, do we agree or disagree? I think we're going to become a whole new species. In, in the next 10 years. And so consequently, whether, but I think being together, whether remotely or in person, this is in, this is in, as in person as, as, and I've learned a lot from all of you people and gain new friends having dinner with Jeff Francis on Wednesday. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. I, you know, so I like what you said about, you know, is there a culture of sharing and setting up? I, th I think the difference is, is that in today's day and age, you need to be purposeful when it comes to that sort of mentorship. Whereas in the old days, it was really easy for me to like walk into the back of a junior editor's, you know, suite and plop down on the couch and just have a chat and kind of, you know, semi spy over their shoulder and just make sure that, you know, they're working in a, in a smart, efficient way. I, I, I noticed, um, it was about six or eight months ago and I was having a meeting with one of our editors and something came up and I was like, oh, yeah, no, you don't want to do it. I said, how long have you been doing it that way? She goes, oh, I don't know, like, coincidentally, three years, <laughs> one pandemic worth of time. And I said, you know what, let's get, let me show you a better way to do it. And, and I think that if you, if you have legacy work habits, you need to force yourself to think about mentoring remotely. And I think if you're new to it, you probably, you know, you're already thinking along those lines. Good, Courtney. Yeah, I agree. The um, journeyman and uh, trainee or uh, apprentice uh, model has been used for centuries. And now that we're going to remote learning, it's really tough to do because there's not necessarily two-way communication continuously between the mentor and the trainee, unless you do something like, you know, take your cell phone and log into a Zoom thing and slide it into your pocket so that your uh, the trainee is watching the video feed, live video feed from the uh, mentor continuously and has the ability to ask a question here or there. But it, what it doesn't give you in that respect is the ability for the uh, mentor to hand off to the trainee, like was mentioned before, and observe how they're doing things and point out things that they're doing wrong. So in-person is always better. Uh, some type of remote AV connection can help with this, but uh, if you're just following instructions and getting tips and stuff, uh, it can slow down the training process considerably if you're not there in person. Yeah, I think that I think that the um, it's a little bit of both, but I think that one of the things that we we've done a lot when we have remotes and we're working is we'll just open up Zoom windows and just leave them open, and so you're sitting there talking and you're listening to things that are going on. Another thing that um, I think that, you know, and you're seeing us play with some of these designs here, um, you know, I think that um, those general kind of meandering conversations are useful. I, I think that, you know, Grant and I had a really kind of fun conversation on Sunday and after hours where, you know, I was making soup <laughs> and Grant and I were talking about production. And I think people, you, those are the kind of things you want to try to, I mean, that's kind of the design of after hours is to, is to have people able to kind of have those kind of conversations. I also think, though, that while you can't do it as informally, the scale at which we can do training now is much different. Um, when we had 
uh, Marcia uh, Kerrigan come on and, you know, cut a show and you want, we had, you know, a hundred people watching and able to listen to her um, cut a show. Like, so you're able to listen to someone who's done a thousand shows and a hundred people can sit there and, and, and listen and, and then they can ask questions afterwards and she can talk through wh what her thought process was and how she was approaching it and everything else. You don't get that most of the time. You, you know, even when you're on set, you don't, you don't get that. And maybe, maybe you're in the right place and one person gets to do it here and there. So the opportunity to train a lot more people at scale um, is much higher now than it was before. Um, the way, can we do it the way we did it the old way? No. Uh, is the old way the only way to do it? Probably not. <laughs> so, so I think that, you know, I think that we're, we're getting close. You're going to see more and more of us doing behind the scenes. Uh, my brother's probably going to come down and do a shoot and we're going to let you just watch him set up, you know, you know, and, and build up and everything else. And, but the difference is, is that I couldn't put a hundred or 200 people in the room, um, to sit there and watch him do that. But I can put a bunch of witness cameras up and let people do it and have him answer questions and so on and so forth. So I think that that's, that's the kind of thing that, um, you know, so we can do things, we can do the training at scale. It's just not, it's just not as haphazard as it was before. Uh, it, it's a little, it just needs to be a little bit more designed. All right, we are jumping into our second hour and talking about behind the scenes. I have one to show. And if uh, if uh, other panelists want to raise their hand and have anything else they want to do a show and tell, uh, go ahead and raise your hand. And as you watch this, um, go ahead and throw. This gets exactly what we were just talking about. We're going to show you a little behind the scenes. Uh, we're going to answer some questions about it um, and hopefully talk uh, through uh, some of the issues there. Um, and we'll do these probably, I, I think that it's good to see real productions and we can talk theoretically about a lot of things, but we can also talk about what we've actually done. So I'll show this first one and then um, we will um, go to other panelists that want to show something that they uh, that they want to do here. So let me um, see if I can get this all working here. I, I broke something yesterday, so I was fixing it this morning. So hopefully it'll, it'll all work here. So this is in Germany. Uh, you can see Brent, <laughs> Brent by hanging from uh, from our railing here. Uh, we had ordered one type of railing and got a different type of railing. And um, and so this was only, uh, you know, this wasn't box railing or, or triangular railing. It was a, it was just a straight, um, you know, this is a truss, but straight truss. And so uh, one of the things that, you know, what Brent is, is exceptional at is um, just, you know, kind of uh, jerry rigging a lot of, of things here. So what he did is he used these clamps to stabilize this bar so that it wouldn't spin, you know, wouldn't spin back and forth because all we had, we, the way our, the way our clamps worked here is we had to clamp it in here. Um, and then it was just going to rock back and forth. And so by locking it with these two magic arms, uh, and you know, Brent was able to, um, kind of tie that together. It was a little, little scary, but the reason he's obviously the reason he's hanging on it is to make sure that it's actually going to work. Um, and so, uh, so that was the, uh, so he, you know, we weren't putting anything near his weight on it. So it was, it was fine, but that was, and what happens is you show up on a day, the day, the load in day, and you don't have a choice. Like you have to figure out how you're going to make it actually work. Um, this is what it looked like. Um, this was in Berlin. Um, and, uh, this is, uh, so we were in this really, uh, this is kind of the hardest thing here. So you, you, um, you, you have this, uh, this huge open area there, but we made that work. Um, that we flew, flew all of us in. This is when we talk about carnets. We flew all, you know, our gear is kind of our, our setup. So this was all built and figured out in our office and then packaged up. Um, a couple of things that you can see here, Brent, after hanging from that is, you know, is doing, this is the remote control for the telemetrics. We'll show you the telemetrics here in a second. Um, Holger, uh, you know, Holger is doing playback here. Uh, uh, um, Kevin is doing, uh, he's cutting the show here. Um, you can see our, our ter uh, those are um, Terranexes over there to make conversions. Um, and uh, we're managing the stream over here. And so that's, you know, kind of a, a, a very compact uh, system that we have here. Um, and, you know, this was all kind of figured out and laid out in the, uh, in the scene itself. Uh, here you can kind of see an over overhead view of it. So here's our audio section here with Brian, um, and then uh, again, as we said, these are this is in code and the and our Terranexes. This is our edit playback, um, camera control, streaming, um, and all of it had to kind of fit into. It. We were given, you know, we weren't able to do a walkthrough, so we really just had to take pictures and hope that it all worked. Um, 
I don't know if this is uh, Sam, uh, who did, he was the one that uh, talked to you about F1. He was managing transmission for F1. This is before Sam was, was working for F1. Um, and so uh, so there's Sam there. And what, what he's doing here is, of course, managing time, watching the stream. This is, in this case, Facebook. And then he's managing the elementals here. So that's the that's what he's um, he was kind of making making all of that work. Um, the uh, kind of a wider shot of what that all looked like. Um, so these trusses, of course, big soft lights. We needed a fair bit of light to keep up with the background. That's the real you know challenge you know as we um, kind of work through that work through that process. Um, the um, here you can see you're wondering why we have this black this little black area here. So we 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 definitely requested that, um, and it's because you know when you're doing things fast and you don't know exactly what you're going to do, you end up with a big pile of cables, and we just decided we wanted to, to look a little look a little nicer uh, for the clients as they walk through. So unless they were really looking for it, they didn't they didn't get to see our our mess that was there. Uh, here's here's uh, Brian, and he's um, you know he's managing basically. This is uh, managed to an X32. You can see we had some accent mic accent mics in here. We were using FreeSpeak as the as the comms um, there. Uh, here's kind of the overhead view. So you know here's our our uh, obviously our lighting. You can see that these are the telemetrics heads. So these are you know a standard kind of cross. So th that's what these are doing here, um, and then we had. Um, we had two wide ones here. So we had one that was kind of a lock off wide and another one that was able to grab uh, close ups there. And so that's kind of there. Now you'll see here, these are, um, you know, we have, uh, we would use these mesh uh, sleeves to put all the cables that have to go to and from all the cameras um, to make all of that work. So um, the, that's what that's what you're seeing, you know, along here. Um, and, uh, and so that's the, uh, but this is kind of the basic uh, layout there. Um, here's a closer shot of these telemetrics heads. So these are the telemetrics heads, Black Magic Ursas. Um, these are uh, these are the uh, Fujinon um, Cabrillo lenses um, on those, and then all of that is all fed, you know, fed back through the system here. So that's and and um, it does two things. One is we don't have to bring so many camera operators or find them, but the biggest thing is is it allows the oper it it allows it to be a much uh, uh, less um, distracting thing for the for the for the hosts, um, so they you know they they don't have as many people around them. Down here, you can see these are what we call um, in in Europe they're called comfort monitors. In the United States, we tend to call them confidence monitors. There's any kind of messaging that we need to send to the um, to the hosts, uh, oftentimes notes and, and and other things like that. It's not necessarily a telestrator, um, but just um, some notes that they may they may um, need or be be, be interested in. Um, and uh, so here's here you can see this kind of in a wider shot here. Um, those are those um, the, there. And we also have, there's another one here, and that is primarily so that the host here can look look like she's looking at them, but she's actually looking past them um, to make that actually work. Um, so that's that's why we have that um, inserted there. Um, and you know the 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 nice thing, the hard thing about a white, is just the exposure. The nice thing about it is, is it does produce a lot of, having lighter things here produces a lot more bounce and does some fill under under here that we wouldn't get otherwise. So that was, you know, kind of useful. And it's a lot of light because all this light is coming down here and then irradiating out here. So the, this light doesn't really affect the floor as much as the outside light coming in. So it, it really gave us a lot of push, but we did need a lot of light just to keep up with that. Now, one thing that we did push for is, you know, the, this kind of um, not white, you know, dark and not white um, backgrounds there. Uh, it really makes it a lot easier when most of that's what's in the shot to not have it be white because um, then we have to manage that that exposure as well, um, which is usually something we're not excited about. So anyway, that's a little um, quick show and tell. If you've got questions about that, we'll go ahead and do a couple more show and tells. But if you've got questions about that, um, uh, go ahead and throw uh, your questions in. Go ahead, Courtney. Oh, I didn't know I was going first, but uh, let me uh, talk. And Alex, that was a great, great informational piece on on how we work today in the world of AV. Um, my show and tell is going to be a throwback. Uh, nice. Because many, many years ago, many of you know that uh, I worked as a production sound mixer. And one of the films that I worked on was called Roar, which was... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> quite an experience <laughs> and i had to think on my feet every day uh at the risk or of die 
getting a takedown. Here's a review of Roar. It says it's like Walt Disney went insane and shot a snuff version of Swiss Family Robinson. Yeah, it was working on the set with 120 lions, tigers, leopards, cougars uh, every day. What, what could possibly for, go wrong? For two years, what could possibly go wrong? And uh, here's a look at my setup that I use to record the sound here. This is kind of a behind the scenes picture. So you can see what we had to work with back in the day. This was 1976. This is me sitting at my sound cart with uh, two Nagras. This one's a stereo here on the left and a mono one on the right. And I had, uh, because of the situation where you're working, uh, you see there's a chain link fence behind me, you know, to try and keep the lions away from me while I'm sitting down so they won't be breathing down my neck. Uh, I had a, uh, a video monitor, a Viticon uh, monitor and a portable uh, DC powered monitor. And, and I rigged up a little uh, remote pan tilt uh, uh, head, uh, designed, built it myself uh, to be able to move my little Viticon camera back and forth uh, so that I could uh, monitor where the cats were at any time. Because trying to record dialogue in a situation where uh, you know, the cats are jumping up on people, et cetera. That, that can be uh, quite problematic. So I would have to plant microphones sometimes uh, just, just in order to, to get the sound. I'm trying to find, oh, there it is. Uh, one other picture here. Uh, this scene I had to record sound on. Uh, it's a little hard to see here, but it's, uh, it's uh, the main director here who is, has dialogue. He's driving a 34 Plymouth with 265 pound, uh, I mean, 650 pound Bengal tigers in the back seat. And there's a guy hanging on the back that he's another uh, character act that he's talking to while he's driving. The DP, uh, Dion de Bont, was uh, strapped to the front of this car as it's driving uh, off road through uh, a variety of. Uh, uh, gullies and and uh, uh, dirt roads. Now I'm recording sound in this situation since it's a self-contained car. Well, how am I recording sound? We didn't do it wirelessly. Uh, I am laying down on the floorboards. My feet are underneath uh, Noel's uh, feet here, and I have the Nagra sitting on the passenger side seat of the car, and a handheld microphone coming in from underneath underneath. Uh, so Noel. you're under the tigers. Yes, not under the tiger. They're in the back seat okay. and their feet are up on the front seat. They're drooling on me because I'm right below. I'm right below this tiger here, right down here with my head is tucked under the dashboard. Uh, and my uh, legs are across the scene here, across the, the car. And I'm mixing uh, on the Nagra, uh, rolling the Nagra with uh, the recorder uh, with one hand and mixing with the other and holding the microphone with my third hand. Uh, but... <laughs> Wow. Those are the kind of situations we would get into on a daily basis. And, and that film, which I worked on for two years, and we shot mostly in uh, Acton, California, but a lot. And, but we did shoot for a month in Africa, which was also quite a challenge. Um, uh, thought me, you know, taught me to think on my feet and to be able to capture the dialogue in a, a large variety of situations under the most uh, severely stressed uh, uh, you can think of. <laughs> Did you end up with any scars? I am one of the few people that never got, there were 70 crew members and actors that got injured on this movie during the production. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, oh. Nobody died, uh, at least not during production. Uh, you know, the, the director's brother did drive his car off the cliff in Soledad Canyon at the rap party, unfortunately. Uh, but other than okay. that, um, which was a sad thing, but the, uh, other than that, during the production, uh, nobody was, uh, a lot of people were injured. We had our own wing at the Acton Hospital, so uh, <laughs> where we would constantly take people who got uh, chewed on. But I managed to. I, I'm the logical one. I'm the pragmatic one. I would look at the situation and, and suss out, you know, where are the tigers, lions and tigers are going to be? Where am I going to be? And how can I protect myself from them? And, and uh, still do my job and the ability to plant microphones and scenes where you know you really didn't couldn't use wirelesses because the actors are going to jump in the in the river and swim away at the end of the scene uh 
I had a similar situation to the car of being in a boat. I don't, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of pictures, <laughs> behind the scenes pictures back then. This was before phones and digital cameras. So the only pictures that were allowed was from the still photographer and the rights of those pictures are tied up in negotiation somewhere. Uh, so, and I had lunch with a still photographer just last week. Uh, so I asked him to send me some stuff, which he hasn't yet. So maybe I'll get some more behind the scenes. I, I, I feel like there's a whole second hour about Roar. Do you think you could pull together uh, like three or four people to, if I can get the guy to send me and I had lunch with the, uh, well, get him boom, to come on, get him my to come boom on. man, uh, Tim Cooney lives in, uh, in Las Vegas. Maybe I can get him to shoot over to Preto's house and put him in the B studio and have yeah. him interview for the second hour. And he's going around doing a speech of his work behind the scenes. He started as the elephant trainer and he's, he expressed the uh, desire to move into sound. So I brought him on as a boom man, which is great because I had an animal trainer then as a boom man. So he wasn't afraid necessarily to get in there right. amongst all the cats uh, and elephants and other things. So does he have any scars? Uh, he, let's see. I think he got out without any scars too. He <laughs> <laughs> Both of us were always watching our backs, you know, yeah. <laughs> we yeah. watched out for each other. Uh, but it was a, definitely a challenging situation. You know, these days you got to watch out for the, you know, CEO looking over your shoulder for some reason and, and asking a stupid question. And we had to watch out for the, you know, tigers, lions, and tigers, and bears. <laughs> great if you can organize an, a, a three or four people from roar and get the photos we should definitely do a second hour it would be, um, it'd be i'll amazing. have to say the the still photographer is actually uh uh living uh occasionally going out to the ranch the ranch is still there where we shot it it's now shambhala preserve and there's still a few cats out there not any of the ones we use in the movie they're they're long passed away but um uh tippy hedron is still out there and she's 94 Wow. Uh, still living out there in the same double wide trailer that she lived in when we made the movie. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, go ahead, Jason. That is the most compelling case I've ever heard for CG for all future animals in motion picture <laughs> it's of the all time. Like, it's just why not the same. I point out that movie that, yeah, it's called Roar. Uh, so if you look up uh, for the trailer for it, you can you can watch. The, uh, it's, it's I won't show the trailer here, but you'll see what the is craziness it, was. There was is, no CGI. There were no split screens. There were no optical effects. It was all real in camera. So, is there somewhere you can watch the whole film? Is it on? Uh, yeah, I think it's available on Apple. Actually, there you go. Apple TV. Well, I I, OK, to I'm going to try to follow that, but it's not going to be easy. <laughs> just just so, search for Roar, the most dangerous movie ever made. OK. <laughs> Go ahead, Jason. This was the least dangerous production um, of all time. This was just a, a corporate thing that I did um, two or three years ago. This was um, only complicated because it required a whole bunch of um, of DVEs, which I ended up having to do with a whole bunch of switchers because I, I didn't have a anything fancy enough to do it. So, um, you know, I, I daisy chained a bunch of, of things together. This was a, a board of trustees meeting. And... Um, so, you know, this is this is a um, TV studio 4K Pro, which did 4K 60, a uh, bunch of ISO recorders, playback and whatnot. And then um, you'll notice down there, there are um, a pair of ATEM minis that are just kind of set and um, and plugged into each other so that I could do the, um, as Alex calls them, comfort monitors, which I like. I actually really like that. Um, the English got that one right. Um, there's the TV control to control them. They are at my feet, and these were the board of trustee members that were in uh, that were on site. The rest of them were in, um, you know, on remote, and um, and then the employees um, got to watch it through a real time encoding. Um, this was probably the most elaborate, um, tiny little corporate event I've ever done. Um, that is, that's most of it. And, um, yeah, had, had, had a Ronin. I don't remember if I actually ended up using it, but it was one of those, you know, you, you, you pack in the day before with yay much gear. And, um, if you're lucky, you're not using all of it, um, by the end. It was, it was a fun job. And, um, what I learned from that is when in doubt, pack it and see whether or not you're going to need it. Uh, another fun little call out from that one was 
This was the first time that I figured out that I could take a Mac Mini, if you see the cables at the top of that, uh, I figured out you could take a Mac Mini and plug it in and get a Visa mount and take that Visa mount and plug the Visa mount to another Visa mount, in this case, on the back of the 4K Pro monitor. So that's a, just, it's like a, a Visa mount holder for the Mac Mini? Yes, it's a Visa mount holder on a Mac Mini that I spaced away. So, in, so you know, one's mounted on the rack and then the other one is just offset ever so slightly. And I could actually get away with using two of them side by side, one on, you know, the two of two left on the Visa, two right on the Visa. You just space them out and they fit beautifully. Huh. So there you have it. <laughs> Alex is furiously searching for yeah, Mac exactly. Mini Visa mount. <laughs> like, it's like that, that time I put a lazy Susan under a desk for the studio and he's like, oh, that was cool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Um, I didn't, I, I mean, I should have known we were doing this. I just put together, a, I just grabbed a couple of things off my phone. Uh, as you know, sometimes I do um, big, giant, multi-screen uh, presentations. Uh, and a couple of years ago, I think this will work. So this is, uh, as you, as you walk into the, uh, the hall, this is what it looks like. You come around the corner. You guys should not, yeah, you're not hearing any audio here. So there's the screens. This was five, this was nine screens across the front of the room. And if you know that logo, you know who it's for. Um, and there was a combination of uh, square screens, you know, one-to-one -one aspect ratio, two-to-one aspect ratio, and uh, 16 by nines. And if you notice, uh, I don't think you could, uh, can you see my mouse? You can't see my mouse. But those two bright screens in the middle that go all the way down to the floor, they actually opened up and were a doorway. And uh, that's the way the audience came into the room. They came through, they would walk through the screens and then go sit down and turn around and see this giant, uh, 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 you know, ordeal of stuff. This was the screens being lit up for the projectionists so that they could uh, organize everything. And uh, I did all this in Final Cut. I didn't make this image. This is their, his test signals. But I cut this all in Final Cut. Here it is uh, uh, playing some content. And then uh, the nice thing about having multiple screens on the front is even for iMag, you can split it up. So they would just keep the wide shot and then they could do the close-ups on the one-by-ones. And then if you're interested in knowing more about how this stuff kind of stuff gets edited on Ripple Training uh, a couple months ago, I did a, they asked me to be um, on their, I think they call it their uh, creator spotlight or something like that. And on that interview with Mark and Steve, I went through the whole, um, the whole process of how I organize and edit like that in Final Cut. And this, I just, we talked, we asked this question earlier, how do I grab a frame off of YouTube? This is me doing the most crude of grabs off of YouTube I did about three minutes ago. Uh, but it's, it's super interesting editing something like that because you, in this particular instance, although I needed to edit something that was like 12,000 pixels wide by 1080, uh, I needed to deliver nine different files, actually 10 if you consider the audio file, which I had to do also. And so how do, the question becomes, how do you edit that? How do you set that up? And how do you edit things to music across nine different screens? Anyway, uh, I went into it in, in somewhat in depth uh, with Ripple training. And I mean, we could do it. We could do more of that here if you're ever interested. But Yeah, 100%. Um, I, I think I can get away with showing that footage. Um, actually, well, I, I'm sure I can. Well, let's put it this way. I won't get in any more trouble because I already showed it to to, <laughs> to Mark and Steve. Well, but um, yeah, I do those kind of things uh, all the time. Yeah, let's get you on. Let's, 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 let's have you on for a second hour and break that down for us. I think it'd be really interesting because I, I, I don't, um, so you're editing all of those together and then looking at them together across those screens and then you're going to export them out one by one. Is that kind of how you're approaching that? I'll give you the briefest of things. So step one is you make a canvas that is the total number of pixels wide of all nine screens. Right. Step one. Step two is you make a sub comp or in Final Cut, they call it a compound clip for each screen. Step right. three you put all of those compound clips inside the master comp. And that's why 
on, uh, uh, oh boy, I hit the wrong button. Sorry about that. Um, that's why on this screen, you see um, there is a compound clip for each of the, the subscreens, okay? Right. Each of the nine screens. But you're going into each compound clip to make any changes in timing? That is correct. So there's a couple of, a couple of cool tricks you do. One, in the master, and, and the reason I have to have the master, uh, the master comp is I need to see how it all plays together. And also, that's the way the client's going to buy off on it. So every right. time I have a new revision, I send them this, this ridiculously wide, short video that they watch on their laptops at, at corporate and go, yeah, I like the video. It's coming along really well. Um, and actually, this particular producer, she has a, the best compliment you can get from her is this. I don't hate it. Um, <laughs> and so, <laughs> but, so you, 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 that's how you audition and that's how you share the file is by sharing the whole thing. On right. this particular play out, they needed 10 different files, nine screens and an audio file. And so when it comes down to sharing it, I don't have to cut the file. I already have compound clips for each one. So I just go into the, my browser, I select the nine compound clips, Command E, export all of them, Dunsky. Um, so then what you do, Alex, is you put the audio in each one of the compound clips. And what I like to do is before I, once I get my audio track uh, kind of settled on, is I'll go through that. That becomes a compound clip also because a lot of times there's sound effects and stuff in it. Right. And I'll put beat markers on it. And then I take that compound clip and I put it in each one of the screen compound clips. Cut me off when you when you want to move on. I no, put that on. in each one of the screen compound clips, and then I turn the volume down on the sub comps in the master clip, but I have the audio down at the bottom. Now you'll like this, Alex. There's one last thing you do. You make I make what I call a master overlay or the overlay compound clip. And that is another um ridiculously wide by 1080 compound clip that I put on top of each one of the sub compound clips. But I have, now that one you have to manually wiggle it so it lines up and you get just the right pixels per screen. And then if I want to animate something across all nine screens, I put right. it in that layer as, a, as, as an overlay. And then right. that thing will go across all, whoop, sorry, sorry, fl cardboard flag. Uh, that thing will go across all nine screens and if I want to edit it, I just go into that compound clip, diddle fiddle, diddle fiddle, adjust the timing, step out, hit play. Okay, that works. Yeah, I think there's definitely a second hour there. It's su it's super deep, and it's and it's a workflow that I've been working on for about 15 years, but uh, not I was doing it. I've done it in. I used to do it in After Effects before Final Cut 10. Final Cut 10 is so superior in terms of playback. And once Final Cut 10 had the ability to make custom canvases, it's like a oh, good night. Uh, one time, uh, one quick story, and again, cut me off, just mute me if you're done. One time I showed up on site, the screen was 10 to 1 aspect ratio. It was for a certain Bavarian car company. Um, and I was asked to make a 16 by nine. We had a great day yesterday video. Right. And I walked into the hall and I looked at the screen and I was like, wow, this thing looks fun. This is a fun screen. So first thing I did is I went back to the projectionist. I said, Hey, how do you, what, what kind of video files would I have to give you to fill the screen? He goes, just a single file. I said, okay, good to know. Good to know. Then I went to the producer and I said, so you want this thing 16 by nine, right? She goes, yeah, I'm just going to pip it five times across the screen. I said, but what if we didn't do that? She goes, what do you mean? I go, I can make a full canvas thing. She goes, can you? I said, yes, I can. She went, you have 24 hours to turn this video around. I can do it. Are you sure? Yes. So I went to my room and I started building the timeline and I uh, started cutting away. And the executive producer walked in at around, I don't know, four o'clock in the afternoon. He goes, I need to see what you got so far. So he pulls up a chair, I rewind the timeline, I hit play, and he goes, stop. And I'm like seven seconds into the play out. Yeah. And he looks at me, he goes, 
is this going to fill the whole screen? And I said, yes, it is. And he went, cool. Okay, start it over. <laughs> I, t- I got to tell you, I won so many brownie points with that guy on, on that moment because it, I it talk about above and beyond, but I would have never tried that in anything but Final Cut. Right. Yeah. It would have been too slow. Yeah. It, and, and, and yeah, the layout. And, you know, that those are the moments that a lot of times are, you know, I was, I've been really thinking about the, the importance of the concept of surprise and delight. You know, you hear that a couple of times in a couple of companies where, you know, you want to figure that out and being able to, if you have a skill that is kind of, you figured this out, you've done this in the past and you're able to add it to, you know, add it into a system. Uh, you know, I think it, it really goes a long way. I mean, that's how you can, clients want to hang on, you know, to, to you because you're going to add something that they, that they didn't even expect. It's not like they're trying to, most of the time, I think clients are happy if they get 75% of what they imagined. And if you can give them 110 every once in a while, 120 or 150% of what they imagined, they, that's the kind of production they want back. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. It's very cool. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, there's a second hour that Chris is going to do on long screens. Because I think long screens are cool. Yeah. So we'll, we'll talk about that. All right. Let's jump into the questions. Oh, sorry. That took, took me, caught me right off guard there. All right. Douglas Carmichael writes in, interesting how you use the Manfredo camera tripod components to stabilize overhead truss. Wouldn't that be a no-no in venues with more rigid rigging safety requirements? 100%. <laughs> like that was not that was definitely not uh uh that was definitely not what we, we we designed if we had had any not osha certified not osha certified and we very specifically put stuff under it and we didn't let people walk underneath it like it was not like a a thing that we were proud of i i did show it there but it was it just shows the I'll, I will tell you it was rock solid like those those magic arms are rock solid they weren't supporting any weight they were only doing uh, keeping it from rotating and the the lights were, you know, a 10th of the weight of Brent. So, so it was so that, you know, we, we tested it a lot and we were worried about it a lot and we would not do it normally, except that we were literally not letting people walk through that space, um, around that, around that area. So, yeah. So, but it was, we did take our, we, we were careful about it, but it was definitely not, not OSHA spec. Uh, next question. Kenny Hampton in Greenville, Illinois, writes in, Courtney, wouldn't boom mics be an invitation as a play toy for the animals? How did you deal with the animals and destroyed microphones? Good, Courtney. Uh, they were, and then many times the director slash star would shout at the boom. Get that microphone out of there. You're distracting the cats. Uh, and so... Uh, we had to be, that's why I had to work with a lot of plant microphones that were disguised and, and hidden in the ceiling of the set. A lot of times I'd, I'd, we'd figure out where the action was going to take place, where the dialogue was going to take place. We blocked the scene without the cats in there. Uh, but then they kind of determined where the action would end up. So they wouldn't necessarily go according to plan since the cats did not take direction very well. And so, and, and also almost every scene is shot by, you know, three or four cameras simultaneously, and they're all shooting, in a, you know, across each other, and they're all grabbing whatever they can get. So you don't necessarily, there was no video assist. So uh, we got very good at, at knowing when the DP was lying to us about uh, how wide he would be. <laughs> and uh, my boom man <laughs> got very good at watching the zoom control on the Panavision camera, watching the zoom zoom ring to know when he was zoomed out wide or when he was in tight, getting an extreme close up, and we'd move the microphone in. But it was a problem occasionally, you know, especially if you have you're outside and you have the dead cat uh, furry thing on that eight sixteen, which looks like you know a giant cat toy hovering above the. Uh, above the scene moving back and forth would distract the cats. But sometimes that helped out because it got them to look up and look interested. And if they looked like they were interested in the person they were supposedly annoying or talking to or being talked to, it did help occasionally. So, uh, yeah, we had that to deal cat with takes on a whole nother meaning on that. Show. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, cat in the frame. Yeah. Cat you in didn't the frame, want to call please. it a dead cat. We call it, I call it a wind weasel. You know, because it was a great <laughs> distractor. We also had other distractors that we would use for the cats, but ASPCA wouldn't be too too happy with how I mentioned it. Uh, I just remember hearing the uh, hearing the command uh, from off camera. Tom, jiggle your pig. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next question. 
Wow. <laughs> Douglas Carmichael writes in, Courtney, did you include any sort of safety systems with your homebrew PTZ head? Go ahead, Courtney. I, there wasn't really a safety system for the PTZ head. I just had a bunch of uh, C-clamps made that were painted brown, and I painted the camera brown so it would blend in with the uh, the ceilings of all the set, which was built, a practical set, which was built out of all wood, bamboo, and burlap that was used to wrap to hold the beams together. So uh, I, we used a lot of burlap to disguise microphones and stuff that were clearly in the shot, but disguised enough that you couldn't tell they were there. And I had to get uh, all brown cables, uh, which was hard to find uh, brown colored cables back then from Electro Voice, so that I could hide the wires that ran to all the plant mics and to the, uh, and to the uh, PTZ camera uh, so that you wouldn't see them. Because in many shots, the camera would zoom out wide and they'd be there uh, in the ceiling, but carefully disguised and covered up uh, so that you, you, know, you wouldn't see them on camera. Next question. Sky Gleason in Seattle, Washington writes in, who decides who is the audience and what do you want them to do? Go ahead, Sky. Well, as engineers, as technicians, as, as creatives, we all have ownership of our little part of the bigger picture. So I'm just curious in your experiences of being on different shows, how do we uh, know who we're supposed to be influencing? Who are we supposed to be, you know, getting this message out to? It's a really important question because I, I think that it's really easy. We see this often at when you watch events, when you watch uh, live events, online events, TV shows. Um, one thing that I notice a lot is I'll see things that people do that are interesting to the production crew, interesting to the producer or director, not necessarily interesting to the audience. You know, like it's not, they're not, um, you know, they're, they're paying attention to, oh, I think this is cool, or I think this is a really useful thing, but is that moving this, to your point, does that move the story forward? Does that in, incorporate the, the audience? You know, I think that that is, um, you know, it's something that we've talked, we, we've really started to talk about a lot, is that, is really understanding that a lot of times we're doing things that entertain us because we do this all the time and we get bored with the, the same thing over and over again but it doesn't necessarily uh translate to the audience as something that particularly matters uh go ahead chris yeah sky i remember one of the first days uh back in some people know i used to direct a show uh, a pbs show called the computer chronicles and it was about the early days of the computer industry. And uh, I worked on it for like 17 years. Uh, but I remember one of the first days when I was directing, because I didn't start as a director, I started doing this. Um, one of the first days when I was directing, I took to a close-up of something. And I noticed that it was, the guy was holding a piece of gear and he was showing it to the host. And I was like, oh, Look at those, look at those connectors on this. Oh, what is that connector? Huh? Oh, that's kind of cool. Okay, take two. And like I realized, oh, I I get to pick. I get to pick what I want to watch. I get to I get to watch the show I always wanted to watch and not just have somebody sitting next to me going, take one. I said take one. You know, because I prior to directing it, I had been the TD. And um, I think that there has to be a level of trust at some point whether it's a big giant event or a television show or a film, there has to be a level of trust at some point. You have to trust, and in a film, it's the editor, as you know. Uh, in a live broadcast, it's the director or the TD or a combination of both of them. But there has to be a level of trust, like do, do the thing you do. And I was um, honored that Stuart Chaffe, the executive producer and host of the show and outright owner of everything, that he would entrust that in me. And he would say, do the show that we do. And the thing was, is like those shows, those shows were one videotape recorder, uh, a live switch, you know, program switch off. The, there was no post. You know, we, all we did was assemble segments. And there'd be occasion when he'd go, why are you showing that so much? But not very often. And, it, and that level of trust that you build with the executive producer, who's also sitting on the set, so he's not sitting over my shoulder going, get off that shot, because he's, he's talent. The executive producer was talent. Uh, but it was, it was, to me, that day, something clicked in me 
in the way shows get put together. I was like, huh, that's kind of cool that he was, that he entrusted that in me because he couldn't change it. Yeah. And I do think that there is a, an alignment that great directors get, which is that they're just interested in what the same thing the audience is interested in. They're like, they're, you know, I, a lot of times when I'm trying to cut a show or I'm directing a show, I, I'm not really trying to think about anything beyond I really, I know what I want to see. Like, I, oh, I want to see that. I want to close up here. I want this to be here. I want this to be here. And I'm, I'm interested in those things. And I have to, at some point, to, to your point, you have to trust that that's what people want to, that you're curious about those things. And sometimes more curious than the audience is. Go ahead, Chris. Or you, you either are showing the audience what they want to see, or you're taking them on a journey, showing them something they didn't know they wanted to see right. yet. Yeah, And, and I, I think, think that that... that I think that that's what a great director does. And I wasn't a great director. I was just, you know, my rule of directing was moving lips in every shot. You do that, you, you get an A, you know, that's a passing grade. And that's kind of what I was going for. But, um, but when you take somebody on a journey and you, you what was the phrase you used earlier, Alex? Delight, uh, surprise, surprise and delight. Surprise and delight, yeah. Uh, one of the producers I work for, she calls it wonder. I need mm -hmm. to bring you a, to a state of wonder. Like, not, not like wander and not like, huh, but like, ah, oh, you know? Right. And so when you can do that, you're taking somebody someplace that they didn't know they wanted to go, but once they get there, they go, guy, I'm glad I was in the car for that ride. Right. No, absolutely. Next question. Douglas Carmichael writes in, did you ever have pushback from the major European networks about the use of BMD cameras and gear? Go ahead, Courtney. Uh, not with BMD. I was on a um, on a series called Outlaw, I think it was, with Jimmy Smith's. Here's a behind-the-scenes picture. We were shooting with uh, Panavise. I think that's an, a Sony camera. I can't remember if we had uh, Alexis or not. But the C camera, they would use uh, Canon, uh, you know, Mark, uh, Mark IVs or Mark IIIs. Uh, as a C camera, occasionally to pick up some close-ups and stuff uh, for about two or three episodes, uh, C camera was always used a DSLR, uh, which was intercut in America. But then suddenly we got the word we had to add another uh, Panavision camera because uh, Germany would not take any of the episodes that had any footage from that Canon um, Mark III in it because something about the color space conversion and they didn't, they, it wouldn't approve or wouldn't convert to PAL or something uh, was a major problem. That's the only complaint that I run into about uh, people in Europe complaining about the type of camera you. You know, the funny thing about that, that, that SLR um, is that uh, it only shot 30 frames a second because the, the, the video team in Canon was not allowed to talk to the audio, to the still team. Um, they were on the same building, different floors, and they're not allowed to inter intermingle uh, at all. And so the vi the still team was just kind of coming up with its own ideas, and they just didn't know what 2997 was. <laughs> like, like they didn't understand what that what that actually meant. So that, that made some of the timing issues. Uh, the compression was a little rough, too. As far as BMD cameras, we haven't really had any, any pushback um, as the cameras came out. Maybe a little bit in the earlier cameras, but as the Ursas came out, especially the mini Ursas, um, generally our shots looked better than broadcast. So we didn't really have to worry about it. I mean, we would just say, uh, you know, like, well, let's just take a look at the video. And like if someone said, what kind of cameras? Oh, we have some cameras. I'm like, well, let's take a look at a video from our cameras and see how it looks. And because they are shooting two thirds inch chips and we're shooting super 35, um, we immediately looked better than they did. <laughs> so, so there was, there was kind of like a, they, you know, if, if anything, I think folks started to feel, they didn't know what cameras we were shooting with. They just knew that they looked a lot better because we were also using lenses that were more expensive typically than the average broadcast lens. And so, so between the lenses and the, and the cameras, we didn't really have any pushback because generally we out, we were outstripping the broadcasters pretty quickly. Um, next question. Sky Gleason in Seattle, Washington, and here on the panel writes in, who are the main department heads of any show? Go ahead, Sky. Early days of COVID, I was, I was kind of offended when somebody said, well, any 13-year-old can push a red button. And I, and I took that because of the ignorance of that individual, the lack of knowledge, not they, and realized they were right. But at the same time, Alex, I loved your original imagery of each person sitting in front of their desk doing no more than two or three tasks. And so that's why these department heads 
are, 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 are very enlightening in the last few years because just because you have the piece of equipment doesn't mean you have the ability to know when to push which red button at what point in the sequence to, to do the job. So yeah. that that's my reference here is, is what we do is very complicated, even though the manufacturer wants to say it's simple. And the because we are as consumers get so much quality material of, on the most part, we, we don't know what it takes to make that happen. So that's why I'd, I'd love to hear the definitions of, of what are the different departments and why. You go, Courtney. Well, on uh, dramatic or scripted uh, television or theatrical films, the department heads, you know, on a series, there's the showrunners, which is really the head of the writing staff uh, that um, uh, cover the story arc and, uh, you know, keep all the writers in line about the uh, um, following the story arc of the particular series. And then from down there, each department, you know, the camera department has the DP is in charge of the camera department and uh, the production sound mixer is in charge of the sound department. And then there's a key grip, uh, which is in charge of uh, the grip department, all the flags, dollies, et cetera. There's a dolly grip that is under the key grip. Uh, then, of course, there's the gaffer, who is the head of the lighting department, and they have a best boy, which is the, the next in line underneath the gaffer uh, that uh, handles uh, lighting and electrical rigging. Uh, let's see, what else? There's um, a variety, you know, the art department uh, is the production designer is the head of basically the art department. And there's the prop master who is the head of the prop department. And all of these people have uh, a secondary, second and third uh, people working under them uh, that take their instructions from the department heads. And so that's basically how it's all organized. Sometimes uh, each uh, production, when it's being put together, the uh, producer or our unit production manager will hire just the department heads first, and department heads will bring in the people that they always work with and ensure that they are working with someone that they know. If you're shooting out of, uh, out of town or in a foreign uh, production location, a lot of times they will insist that you bring in your seconds uh, other than they may take some of the department heads, they may not take all the department heads to the remote location, and they may insist that you pick up uh, local talent from the location where you're shooting. And so that can make uh, production a little more difficult because you're in a situation where you're working with people you've never worked with before, and there may be a language uh, barrier as well in, in working that way. Next question. Uh, Jack Ruppel writing in for Breckenridge, Colorado. What software and hardware have you recently added to your workflow? Why? Uh, what do you hope to add in the near future? Go, Jason. Um, I got so annoyed. This was about a year ago um, with a, a fiber, a company that was pulling fiber through the walls that I actually bought one of these and they are not cheap. We'll, we'll, we'll call them about a used car. Um, this is a um, this is a fiber melter, basically, that will take, you know, two fiber and automatically align it and then splice it together. And um, I ended up needing to do this because they, uh, they, they kept surpassing the kink and I kept having to fix these mistakes, you know, figure them out and then fix them. And eventually ended up, you know, getting this, recording a video, and um, I'll never. I, let me just say there were some severe rewrites on that contract by the time I was, by the time I was done with it. But yeah, this is a, a very expensive and very cool device that'll automatically melt fiber. That's cool. It's very cool. I keep on adding monitors. I think that's a, that's my big monitors are the thing that I keep. I, I added a couple more monitors up here where I have. The, I'm running the tally, you know, on one monitor just so I can tell when I'm on. Um, and then I'm putting the telestrator on another monitor so I can tell what's going, you know, so I can see the next question up here. And that gets into some of the eye line stuff that we were talking about earlier. Uh, next question. Where is it? There it is. Douglas Carmichael writes in, I remember going to an IMAX theater that had a realistic heartbeat sound synchronized to the animation on screen. Does most 3D software support rudimentary audio editing natively or would that be done elsewhere? Good, Courtney. Well, all editing software has uh, audio tracks that are synchronized to the video. Uh, so that's where the synchronization occurs and that synchronization is maintained throughout the production pipeline. It's mixed in sync uh, with the picture all the way down the line to the uh, final 
stuff that is prepared. And a lot of times those 3D IMAX especially is actually a separate sound transport that is transporting the sound that is synchronized via SMPTE timecode to that uh, video. Uh, there might be uh, just a timecode track that is on the film if you're watching film IMAX or on the DCI digital frame format, then there's a separate file that is the audio that is fed out in sync and synchronized with the picture from the video server on the way out. And that's how it's all kept in sync. And you, you can load uh, audio files into a, into a most computer graphics programs and be able to play them out so you can manage your timing as you do the animation. Uh, next question. Uh, Dave Kaufman in Vancouver, BC writes in, how are panelists keeping eyeline? Is there an alternative to a teleprompter? Uh, go ahead, Sky. I was, I misread this question. I was thinking Saturday Night Live and I was thinking big, large cards right, right. behind the monitor. Yeah, I think for a lot of us right now, mine is not, my, my eyeline isn't perfect. Um, I, I look up occasionally and I, and but if I like probably Courtney, my, my camera is right above my monitor. Uh, at the moment, I'm trying to move to a teleprompter for this, but the problem is I use this space every day, and I, you know, so it's not just for the show. And the teleprompter right in front of me isn't great for everything else I do other than this. <laughs> Go ahead, Courtney. Well, it's easy for me to maintain eye line with the camera because I can see the lens is right there, uh, and I just have to have the other. I have the zoom uh, uh, a meeting window just below that, uh, so I'm. You know, if I want to make right. a point, I, I make a point of looking directly into the lens, which I can see easily because there's no teleprompter in front of it. Next question. Let's see. Douglas Carmichael writing in, how do you process medical imaging of CT scan data, for example, to create a realistic fly through animation for a show or event? Uh, wouldn't you need custom software to bring the data into um, C4D, et cetera, et cetera? Um, uh, I lost the. <laughs> um, so I, I can take this if I can if I can share a screen real quick. Yeah. yeah, um, go for it. yeah go the ahead. short answer is no. You don't need any of that. Um, anytime you do some sort of three D, um, this is DICOM, and um, you can you can simply animate it as a series of pieces, and um, and then from there it's simply brought in and and keyed, and there's there's kind of nothing to it. So no, there's nothing custom. Um, DICOM is a, is a known standard throughout research and even in production. Next question. Let's see, here we go. There it is. Uh, Gordon Lake writes in, do you ever get a production, um, do you ever get into a production that is below your skill level and you spend a lot of time biting your tongue? How do you handle it? Gently. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, you know I think that a, a lot of times we, you know, we get into productions that, that the folks are a little behind what we try to do as best we can is to bring it, bring the production as, as much as we can, especially if we're brought in, if we're brought in as a, as another vendor, what you want to do is not try not to make the other folks look bad. So if they're, if they don't know exactly how to do that, you just want to quietly go through it. Chain of command becomes really important. So talking in front of the client about how it could have gone or should have gone or could go is usually a great way not to make friends. Um, so, uh, you know, quietly and just without a lot of authority, just kind of like, hey, we may want to move this over here. Or what do you think about a lot of times questions are really good. Hey, what do you think about putting a camera right over there? Like, you know, like, you know, like, what do you think about doing like, just like, I, I'm just asking you, like, I know, that, you know, like, because we get into a, a lot of situations where, you know, there's someone who's hired us to do something. They've obviously done this once when we've done it hundreds of times. And we don't say, okay, well, you could do it this way, or or what we really should do is do blah blah blah. That's the easy way to. I mean, that's what you people tend to do. What you want to do is go. You know, I was I was I was looking at this. I was wondering, what do you think of this over here? Like, if what if we move that to this to this point over here without any judgment, without any whatever, and they can choose to do it. If they say, oh, I don't know, I want to do it this way. Okay, just 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 thinking about it. But I would, um, but I. Uh, you know, you just want to do the best you can, you know, and, and uh, uh, the, the the goal is to be professional and to make sure that your stuff works all the time. Um, the biggest problem that you get sunk into is people who don't know what they're doing will often ask you to do a lot of things and suddenly you're doing 80 things for them and then something on your end fails because you're over driving. So you got to be careful of keeping your elbows in and making sure that you're only doing what you can do and what you have capacity to do. Um, yeah, go ahead, Courtney. 
Yeah, I've, uh, having worked in the production industry for over 50 years, uh, you have a chance to observe a lot. Uh, and I've worked in many different, uh, uh, had many different hats. I've worked as production sound mixer for many years. I worked as a television cameraman in the very beginning, back in the 60s. And, um, and later as a video playback engineer and as a teleprompter operator. Uh, and occasionally I'll go on set as a teleprompter, as the lowly teleprompter operator, which is, you know, uh, nobody has respect for the teleprompter operator, even less than for the sound. Man. The actors like you because uh, right. you're their brain on set. But I have to, uh, I'll be on a, a production with a bunch of novice people that, you know, haven't been in, in the business that long and I'll have to really bite my tongue. And the only time I'll speak up uh, to say something, if I see them doing something really stupid, that's going to hold the production back or has stopped production because they can't figure something out, I may offer a solution for it. Uh, sometimes uh, if they're stuck, a lot of times as the teleprompter operator, I'll be sitting at the keyboard there and having written, you know, having written a lot for radio as a production uh, production manager and radio and written radio and television spots in the past. Um, I'll, you know, occasionally suggest a rewording of a paragraph to make it easier for the actor to say, cause they're stumbling across a certain selection of words. And so I, I may chime in on that, but, uh, and I will occasionally appreciate that and say, Oh, thanks. You know, that, that really makes it flow a lot smoother. But I, you want to be very careful, as Alex said. You do not want to step outside your lane very often. And people will look at you crooked if, you know, if they knew that I worked with Vilmos Sigmund a lot uh, as a DP and as a director, you know, I picked up a lot of stuff, uh, working stuff on camera and, and exposure and stuff. But I don't mention it to the camera to solve his problems. That's his problem. I'm there as your teleprompter operator, and I can operate the teleprompter. And the one thing I will say on the other side of that, a lot of times I really try to hire people who know their position better than I do. Um, and then I ask them what they think. I do. There's a lot of like, say, how would you approach this? Or what do you think of this? Or, you know, what do you think of this angle? Or, and there are things that I have strong opinions about, about where things go. But when I don't have a strong opinion, I don't create one. I think mistake some people make when they're doing productions is they just feel like they have to be in control and feel like they have to be sure and everything else. And I try to get input from my crew as often as I can, because a lot of them are, you know, I tend to hire folks that are really good at what they do. And um, I, I, it behooves me and the client to listen to what they have to say. All right. Well, that was a good hour. It was a good, good hour talking a little bit about production. I will probably do this every uh, six to eight weeks um, just to kind of just kind of jump into that um, and, and really kind of just have an open conversation about production there. Uh, thank you so much to the panelists who, uh, who came in today. I oh, can't do this without you. And uh, thanks to the uh, incredible producers asking all these great questions, keeping us going exactly two hours long. Um, and we really appreciate all the questions there. Can't do that without you either. And thanks to the incredible crew, the dev crew, the production crew, the, the management crew, all the folks that come together to make this actually happen. Um, we really appreciate uh, all the hard work that you do to make this make this possible. We traveled the Tallock Traversal. We traveled uh, 50,000 miles, 81,000 kilometers. That's 398 million bananas for scale. All right, let's go ahead and jump into After Hours. Oh, Michael, Grass Michael Grassley is going to be good today. We're going to talk about the 100 things we lost on the internet. Be <laughs> things we love lost it. on the internet, like my keys. We got lost. Can 95 through 96 be my mind? Yeah. Where is the TV remote? Or our dignity. Let's go.